had a conversation with somebody yesterday. Uh, so you take your Bible, go to Romans. Um, had a conversation with somebody. Uh, and they were calling about baptism and asking about, you know, does baptism save us? And the Bible says baptism saves us. So how do we how do we reconcile that? How do we interpret that? Because what that does then if we if we say that it's water baptism in a baptistry or down at the river or the pond or the lake or the sea if we say that the rite or the ritual of baptism saves somebody then what we've done is we have taken what should be the work of God alone and put it into the hands of man. And I asked the lady, I've known her for years, I said, so if, if let's say that it declares to us in the Bible that you must be water baptized by somebody. And so you come to me and say, Pastor, I want to be baptized so I can be saved. And I said, what if I don't like you? What if I don't, what if I don't want to? What if, what if I say, well, I'll do it, but it's going to cost you $38,000. Okay, is that, is that price too high? I mean, this is your soul. Come on, you can cough it up. Um, which is what a Catholic priest will demand from if some man dies, he will, it's been done. Uh, Brother Reg was telling me this story and a Catholic priest went to this man surviving sons and told him, cough up 30 grand and we'll pray your dad out of purgatory. And two of the sons were going to pay it. And the third one said, let the blankety blank burn. I don't care. I ain't paying you nothing. Amen. Um, so, uh, in my hand, no price I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. If our salvation was dependent upon any earthly thing down here, we know that earthly things pass away. They vanish away. If we leave it up to a church... Which, what churches believe that their baptism saves you? Do you know of some? Yes. Church of Christ believes that. Give me another one. There's more. Catholic Church believes that. Lutheran Church believes that. Okay? They believe that you must be baptized, you must be catechized, you must recite the catechism you must answer the questions correctly and if that is done to you then you become a church member and because you are a church member you are going to heaven and that puts salvation into the hands of men and men are evil men are corrupt men's institutions even though they may start out great the Lutheran Church was built upon the work and the faith of Martin Luther. Martin Luther may have had some things right, but his church went bad not too long after Martin Luther went off the scene. And so our salvation is not in any earthly possession, any earthly benefit. It's not in any earthly rite or tradition or ritual or anything like that. It is not in the hands of a man or a church. It is in the hands of God alone. Somebody say amen. So um, we're going through doctrines. We've studied the doctrine of God as the Father who is God. We've looked at who is Jesus Christ. We've looked at the Holy Spirit. And we've looked at the Word of God. We determined from Scripture that what we believe, we believe from Scripture. We believe that the Bible was written by men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 
We believe that all of those words have been preserved throughout the centuries. God made sure to preserve every word. Then we also believe that God had them faithfully translated for us who are living in, I believe, these last days. Aren't you glad you have this Bible as a guide to help you sort through what's going on in life? Because it's either you're either going to believe the Bible, or you're going to believe what's on the Internet. And I'm here to tell you, you can't believe what's on the Internet. There's so much out there that's wrong. So we have the word of God given to us. And so now the word of God then presents to us what the gospel is. Um, who can tell me if you remember any of you guys remember last week what the word gospel meant? Who remembers? Huh? Good news. Good tidings. A good speech. A good sentence. Okay, but it's good tidings. Remember what the angel said when Jesus was born. Behold, we bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to who? All people. So that's something else that we'll learn about the gospel. The gospel doesn't just go to the saints. The gospel is to be preached to everybody. Everybody has a right to to hear the gospel at least one time in their life. They may reject it, but they have a right to hear it. Amen? So, uh, the purpose of the gospel, let's look in Romans chapter 1, and let's, um, let's pick it up in verse 16. That's what I have up on the screen, and then we'll read a few verses. We'll go to prayer. Appreciate everybody joining with us. Paul said... Uh, this is the first of his epistles that he wrote, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For, and here's his explanation of it, here's the purpose of it. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein... Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And where was that written? In the Old Testament. So we touched on the issue last week of there are some who say that the Jews were under a different dispensation. Therefore, they were saved by a different gospel. Clarence Larkin's book, Dispensational Truth, what it literally means is there is a different alternative opposing truth for each dispensation of time that God, God saves this people at this time by this method, but then he saves this people at this particular time by a different method and I reject that, wholeheartedly reject it, because he says it's to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith, the just shall live by faith. And then verse 18, what are we saved from? Verse 18 tells us, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Uh, let's read verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Let's go to prayer tonight. Father, we pray... Father, first of all, for all of those, Lord, who have been afflicted uh, by this virus and any other virus, any other sickness, Father, we pray for them tonight. We pray, first of all, 
for the health and the healing of their body. We believe, dear God, that you're the great physician, that you're the one who can control diseases. You're the one that corruption could not touch your holy one. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus and his ability to heal people. Father, we pray, God, that you would bring healing to those that are sick tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for protecting those who have been protected from this virus. Father, we thank you for what we heard today about Brother George's mother. We pray, dear God, that you would just continue to watch over her and bless her, Father, and keep her safe. We pray, dear God, that you would also take this opportunity while you're healing those that are sick or while you're protecting people from being sick. Father, you would take this time to reach down in love and to save people, to uh, convince them that they're a sinner, convince them, Father, that your wrath is sure to come, but also convince them that Jesus, your only begotten Son, died for them. You sent him to save us, not condemn us. And Father, I pray that you would put it in our hearts, Father, as your people, to have a desire to see people saved. Father, a desire to reach out in love to people, to be kind to people, to be careful of people, to love them enough, to warn them about the truth. Father, and to not be mean to them and not use the Bible as a, as a sword against them, but Father, use the Bible as the gospel to them, teaching them the gospel of truth, the gospel of salvation. Father, we just pray, God, that you would help us, dear God, to reach out to somebody who's lost. Some, pray for them. If nothing else, Father, we pray for them. Pray that they be saved. Father, open up our eyes to your gospel tonight. Thank you, dear God, for showing us the way of truth, because all of us here are sinners. And we thank you, God, that through your mercy and your long suffering with us, God, you've cared for us all these years. You've put up with our sins and you've loved us in spite of it. Father, help us to love others that same way. Help me, Father, to love sinners that way, to care for the lost. Bless your word tonight. Open our eyes. Teach us the gospel that we can teach it to others. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. So the purpose of the gospel, number one, Romans chapter one, verse 16. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is, it is how God saves sinners. God doesn't have a plan A. And if that doesn't work, then a plan B or a plan C. There is no other gospel. There is no other way. There's no other method. God gave the law, gave the, the wrath for breaking the law, but then gave to mankind the grace that said, even if you break the law, I can forgive you of all of your sins. But the demands of the law must be met. You know, some of us, are waiting for the day when people like, oh, I don't know, Hillary Clinton, other people, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, anybody else who abused their power in this country to enrich themselves and to try to cheat not only in the last election, but this coming election, I'm waiting for the day for those people to be arrested, tried, and if found guilty, to be convicted of their crimes. Somebody say amen. Those of, you, those of you who say Jeffrey Epstein didn't get what he deserved, I guarantee you he is right now getting what he deserved. Because, so what if man found him guilty of those horrible things that he did, which he did them? Man would put him in jail until the day he died. But that's too good for somebody like that. Amen? 
So right now he is getting exactly what he's got coming. But let me tell you, so is everybody else who commits any sin. You don't have to be a Charles Manson. You don't have to be a Jeffrey Epstein in order to deserve hell. You are born deserving hell. Amen. And that's why we need salvation. Because there is a punishment coming for those who transgress God's law. But there is a salvation coming to everyone who believes the promise of the gospel. He says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. So if you find Thessalonians, just turn over a couple pages. You'll find it, 2nd Timothy chapter 1. Let's pick it up in, oh, I like this one. Let's look at verse 7. This is one that we need a lot of right now. A lot of people are in fear over what's happening in this world. For God hath not, uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. Now, how, how can we reconcile that? Let me stop there for a minute. When we know that one of the seven spirits of God is the spirit of the fear of the Lord, how then can we reconcile this verse with what we know what the seven spirits are? One of them is the fear of the Lord, where it says God has not given us the spirit of fear. What does that mean then? Fear of the wrath of man, the fear of the world, the fear of Satan's wrath, where the devil, if, if you're like me, the devil will jump on you every now and then and tell you you're not worthy, you're not going to heaven, you're not going to make it, you've done too many things wrong, you're still doing things that are wrong, and you're, there's no way in the world you're going to make that. God has not given us that spirit of fear. Didn't come from God. The devil will try to make you afraid. And yeah, it does happen every now and then. And understand this. And I can't emphasize this enough. Because I hear from people all the time who say, I know it's a sin to be afraid. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not a sin to be afraid. Okay? You turn whatever fear you have into calling upon the Lord. Go to God with it. Amen. God's not going to say, well, you're afraid. I, I can't do anything for you. You're having negative thoughts. Well, of course I am. I have a bunch of them. God, God will overcome that. Amen. His word will overcome that. But anyway, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, a spirit of power, a spirit of love, which is one of the uh, nine fruits of the spirit and of a sound mind. Sound mind is, is worth more than all the money in the world. Amen. You can be rich beyond your wildest dreams. Howard Hughes was crazy. He spent his life in self-exile because of all the codeine he took in his life. He was a drug addict, addicted to pain pills, and he had enough money to buy all he wanted. And he was addicted to those things, and it made him crazy. Spent the last year of his life in a clean room, afraid of every little germ and everything like that. He didn't have a sound mind. He had money, but he didn't have a sound mind. God will give you a sound mind. Verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. Don't be afraid of Jesus. Don't be afraid of the Bible. Don't be ashamed of the Bible. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. This verse is one of the many that ruins your best life now ideology. Amen. There will be afflictions that come with believing the gospel. Yet the world is not going to bow and bend to your every will and whim simply because you're a Christian. And I know, I know people who are not of a charismatic ideology who think that they must be on top of the world because they're born again, Bible-believing, fundamentalist Christians and the world must cave into them. And it doesn't work that way. Or that some people believe they don't have to obey man's laws simply because they're saved and they're born again. That doesn't work that way either. There will be afflictions. of The gospel according to the power of God. Verse 9, who has saved us and called us 
with an holy calling, not according to our works. There it is, not according to our works. The gospel excludes all of the works and our deeds of self-righteousness. It excludes all of them. Turn to, hold your place there in 2 Timothy, and turn to Ezekiel 33. And I uh, kind of had a, a roundabout with a young man that believed that you lost your salvation every time you sinned. And he used Ezekiel 33 as the basis for that statement. Um, look in verse, let's see here. Let's start in verse 7. That may be too far back. Look at verse Look at verse 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness, Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. Verse 13, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts to what? His own righteousness and commit iniquity. All his righteousnesses shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. And, and this person used this verse to say that, see, right there it says so. You lose your salvation when you sin. You have to get it back by repentance. And I'm going, that is not what it's saying. It's saying that to someone who puts their trust in their own righteousness. If you think that you are saved and remain saved, by your own self-righteousness or by the good things that you do, God then is eliminating that by telling you in the, if, if your trust is in your own righteousness, the day that you sin, and you're going to, you're going to, write it down, mark it on your calendar, tomorrow afternoon by 3.30, I will have sinned somehow. You're going to. God says that in the day you do, all of your righteous deeds are gone. So then, here's the person who gets out their scales with God. Says, God, look at my scales. Look at all these good deeds that I've done. I, I, I paid money to the church. I uh, did nice things for my neighbor. I uh, was nice uh, to my wife. I was, uh, I was good at work. I did a great job at work. I was honored by the community with a trophy. I have done all of these good deeds. So, they're more than my bad deeds. I know I do more good things than I do bad things. I only do bad things every now and then. I could do good things most of the time. So, I should be able to go to heaven. God says, no, I'm sorry. Because the moment... You did that one bad thing. I took away all your bad, all your good deeds. They're gone. So now, how many, how many sins? So we ask people, how many sins does it take to be a sinner? One. How many sins does it take to go to hell? One. Just one. And it doesn't matter which one it is. So what if, what if we all knew somebody? That was a terrible sinner. Do evil things all the time. Are they getting a worse place in hell than somebody else who doesn't do near as much bad things as they do? No, hell's hell. Lake of fire is lake of fire. And there's no levels to it. No degrees. 
Just as there's no degrees in hell, there's no degrees in heaven either. I don't like this idea. Well, he's going to get greater rewards than me. Or I'm going to get greater rewards than somebody else. I don't like that idea either. I don't think that's biblical. Show me that one in the Bible. It's not there. So God clearly tells you that if you live by your own righteousness in the day you do one thing wrong, you are now guilty. Period. In any courtroom. You know, bringing Jeffrey Epstein's name up again. He did donate millions of dollars to charitable organizations all around the world. He was a billionaire. And he gave money to charities. So that those charities could do good deeds. So... If he actually lived long enough to have a trial, should the jury be allowed to hear about all the good things that he did to wipe away all the horrible things that he did? Should that be brought up? They won't let you bring that up in court. Because it doesn't matter if you do good deeds. You're not there because the court is saying you are an evil person. You committed a crime and you have to account for that crime. If not, then why do we even need a criminal justice system? We don't. If it's the case of people do good things, so therefore that wipes away all their bad deeds. We have a criminal justice system because... People who do bad things must follow the law. Somebody's got to pay for it. Amen? So that's the purpose of it. Now back to 2 Timothy. Verse 10. Uh, verse 9 again. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So here's something else that goes along with the gospel. When did God know that you were going to accept the gospel? Before the world began. Verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Rule number one, death is real. And I'm hearing from a lot of people now who are sounding the good news that there is no such thing as death. They're telling Josiah, they're telling, all the, especially all these new age people and these UFO people. Because they're mixed together. They're telling people that the aliens are telling them that death isn't real. No one actually dies you just leave this world and go into the cosmos to live up in the heavens with everybody else. So you've got some of these UFO people going around telling everybody, and they're big names. And they're telling everybody, death, I'm not afraid to die. Because death, I know death isn't real. They're going to find out different one of these days. That's the lie that was told in Genesis 3. Ye shall not surely die. But God has an alternative gospel for you. But anyway, for life and immortality to light through the gospel. So the purpose of the gospel, number one, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Number two, the gospel then saves us from the wrath of God, which we saw in Romans 1. And it brings us life and immortality through the gospel. Um, Rome, now back to Romans chapter 1. The gospel as a covenant being different from the covenant of Mount Sinai. Covenant of Mount Sinai, God wrote down 10 laws. And I know some of this, you know, to those of you who have been church all your life, you say, well, I've heard all this before and, and so on. Number one, it's good to hear it again. Number two, 
because there are so many liars on the internet. It needs to be taught. It needs to be explained. It needs to be covered from the scriptures because, as I've said, one who used to be in this church has now gone out and started a church based upon law keeping. The idea that we're saved only if we observe the Sabbath, only if we observe the feast days, only if we observe all the dietary laws of the Old Testament, only if we do and do and do and do. And Paul made it clear in Galatians, if that's the gospel that you've chosen, Paul says, I dare you to live by it. Because if you're going to choose to live by the law, don't plan on breaking it ever. Because if you break it, you're going to get the condemnation of it. People don't understand. They think that because they're doing these things that are written in the Old Testament, that they are pleasing God more than people like us who have, God forbid, Christmas. Or who don't have a Passover cedar, Passover service in your home. They're tell, they believe that they, because of their works, please God more than those of us who don't. And what they're doing is boasting about their good deeds. So, it is different. This gospel is different than Mount Sinai. Because in Mount Sinai, God gave them ten commandments. And he said... If you do these, ye shall live. But it's an if. And if you don't do just one of these, you will perish. So Paul says again, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We read earlier how it excludes works, the works of the flesh or the works of the law. Then in Romans chapter 10, let's turn to Romans chapter 10. He then gives us how a person receives the gospel. Everything is included in the scripture. God didn't leave it a mystery. He didn't leave it up to us to figure it out. He didn't leave it up for one church to come up with one way to, of salvation and then another church to come up with another way of salvation. And it's good for both of them. He gives us how to receive the gospel. Romans 10 verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And believe it or not, there's an... Uh, a crazy guy on YouTube that years ago blasted me for preaching this because he had determined that that was written to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. And so if you do this, it's a work salvation. And he is crazy too. He, I mean, he was more than me. But what does it say? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. By the way, it is verified. I said this yesterday. Your brain operates because there's neurons in here. Neurons are the cells that transmit information back and forth by electrical pulses. Guess what? Your heart has over 40,000 neurons on it. Same thing that your brain is made out of. So when God said that if you believe it in your heart, he wasn't making that up. That wasn't a metaphor. You literally can believe with your heart. Because your heart has the same kind of cells that your brain has. 
And how did Paul know that? He didn't. God just said, Paul, write this down. Trust me. Trust me. All right. So that's what the thief on the cross did. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was believing that Jesus was going to rise from the dead even before he died. And he called him Lord. And was he baptized? Yes. With the Holy Spirit. Who caused him to believe to begin with. Then you got the other thief mocking him, saying, if you're the son of God, why don't you catch yourself down from here? Guess where he's at right now? Okay? Not in paradise. Amen. So now, uh, let's read down very quickly Romans 10, verse 11. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent even as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring. Here it is. There's the definition. Glad tidings. Of good things. The, that's what the gospel means. Verse 16. For they have not all obeyed the gospel. And how do you obey the gospel? He says it. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So how do you obey the gospel? What work do you do? You don't. Obedience of the gospel means believing what it says. And this, this passage in Isaiah that he quotes in verse 16, Lord, who hath believed our report? Does anybody know what chapter that is, where that comes from? Write that down in your Bible. It comes from Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 is where it says, um, it pleased God to bruise him. By his stripes we are healed. Everything that they did to Jesus on the cross is recorded in Isaiah chapter 53. Which is what the Ethiopian eunuch was reading. In the chariot on his way to Jerusalem. When Philip saw him and the Lord said, go talk to him. So Philip says, can I join you? He says, yes. And he finds the eunuch reading the book of Isaiah chapter 53. Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And the eunuch says, is he talking about himself or some other? And the Bible says, Philip, from that scripture, began to teach and preach unto him Jesus Christ. And when he saw it, and when Philip said, see all that stuff that they did here? That was done to Jesus of Nazareth. And I saw it happen. I know it happened. I'm one of his disciples. And the eunuch said, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And what was the answer? The missing verse. Okay. At chapter 8, verse 37. If thou believest with all thine heart. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He's saved. He's baptized right then. Right then he's baptized. Then... They go down into the water. And do you have to go down into the water to just sprinkle somebody? No. Sprinkling doesn't baptize people. Amen? Amen. And then one more, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, uh, I want us to, here's how I want to do this. I want us to bow our heads. I'm not going to have an invitation. Okay? But everybody, everybody listening, everybody watching online, I want you to bow your head for a minute. Okay? Because I know, I've been through times where I wasn't very close to God. I've been through times where there was sin in my life. And I was afraid that because of things I had done, I was never going to go to heaven.
But even when I was at my worst, I still believed that salvation was not based upon what I had done or what I had not done. My salvation was based upon what I believed. What I believed. Now, maybe right now, between you and God, everything's great. But maybe at some point, a month from now, a year from now, you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble. And the devil's going to jump on you and say, you ain't saved, you never were saved, you're not ever going to be saved, God's disqualified you, look what you've done, look at the mess you've made. And you're going to remember, the Holy Ghost is going to bring this to your mind. It is by grace ye are saved through faith, through belief. So, do you still believe that God saves sinners? Do you still believe that when you're even at your worst and you're your farthest from God, you still believe that Jesus died to save you? Do you still believe it? You carry that with you now for the rest of your life. Because with all of us, it's always about belief.